Strings of Malice, Book One, Snowflake in an Alley, An Old Mother Nonsense Story. Chapter 16, Storm of Horrorlings. Yatal, 19th Slarit, New Moon. When they finally came to the foot of the Bent Bridge Heights, the skies were not inviting. A storm was gathering to block out the little sunlight remaining, and the company could not go back. The horrorlings, as Jane had termed them, had been tracking them particularly closely that day, not prepared to strike now that the company had the advantage of numbers, and they ill and injured apparently revived and recovered, but the creatures still lingered just a tree behind an impending, driving force that doggedly refused to give up. As thick clouds blackened above, wisps gathered around in droves to keep pressing them on. When the sky finally opened, the first drop had barely hit the ground before the horrorlings were on them and snapping at their heels. They fought valiantly, but with two of them non-combatants and another sobbing because the poor wolves were not at fault for their actions and could not understand why they were not shown mercy, their only option was to retreat. Trissy fell behind when she stepped in a hole and her thin frame could not hold the momentum, snapping her leg mid-shin. Byrne could not leave her to die alone, and valiantly, if fruitlessly, promised to hold as many of them off as long as he could. Jane called him a damned idiot and went with them until the wisps split down two parts, one leading back into the forest, the other leading further up the mountain. Jane immediately demanded they follow her back, but Nimu insisted they keep west. With little more than a moment to make their decision, Irinka pulled Lunrith along after the doctor, who had, predictably, followed his ward. They didn't hear the scream within the storm, as the mischievous pack of trapped souls led Jane off a cliff in the dark, but they did see a light up ahead. Now out of the forest, Dr. Gascaras tried to move them along faster with magic, but he was still too weak from its continuous effects and didn't bother with a second attempt until they came upon a temple. Built into the side of the mountain, the structure was old, the pointed towers like daggers reaching up towards the sky that lit up like lightning rods every time thunder cracked. A light from the topmost tower beckoned them and they sprinted until their lungs burned, past crumbling arches and broken statues of angels, no longer recognizable from determination or shadow or both. Irinka hit the doors first. She pulled on the handle with all her might, but the heavy doors did not budge. Nimu came next and Lunrith followed, the two women shouting to be less in before being pushed out of the way by the doctor, who grabbed the large iron ring and twisted it clockwise. Lunrith slashed at the first of the horrorlings as it came upon them, and his cries were drowned out by another crash of thunder. Lightning lit up the area, revealing hundreds of them scaling the mountain below but he didn't see any more as hands in the back of his coat hurled him inside. Irinka and the doctor were already shutting the door, and Nimu swung her axe, amputating yeah. one claw forearm that had followed Lundrith in. Scrambling to his feet, the general shoved his shoulder against the door, and Irinka managed to finally force the bolt into place. All was quiet for a moment, before a high-pitched roar erupted. Yeah. Soon joined by another and another and another until it became continuous wail that spilled all the way back into the forest. The wisps that had led them here jingled at their scheme to thwart the horrorlings' dinner plans. One bopped around Nimu before floating up and was followed by the rest. <laughs> Irinka started laughing from sheer adrenaline or relief, but was quickly stopped as Lana put a firm hand over her mouth to silence her. The entry hall in which they stood still had one shattered window, which the creatures could get in through, if they were to discover it and... Well, Jane might not have been the only one duped by the little nonsense souls. That's just silly. Your sister flaps her hand dismissively at the story weaver, and you do your duty, as the older sibling, to smack her across the back of the head. What? She whines, clearly undeterred. Everyone knows wisps aren't real. You begin to wonder if the hot chocolate might have something to do with it. She's never this unruly at home. At least not where your parents can see. Is that so? 
Old Mother Nonsense asks her, leaning back in her pillows with a small smirk playing on her lips. Do you know that? Or is that simply what people say? No one this side of Greykin has known one, your sister states matter-of-factly, and you stare down at your empty cup. You never told her. Would you like to meet one? The question catches you off guard, and swallowing feels like sand in your throat. It'll just be a trick, your sister accuses, until Old Mother Nonsense floats to her feet and gestures for both of you to do the same. You both look ready to nod off. The woman hums and opens the door to chilly air and... Sunlight? Has the night already passed so quickly? Some wisp tea will perk you right back up. Do bring your cups. Your knees shake ever so slightly as you follow them outside. For a woman who is supposed to be older than time, she is quite adept at climbing her tree and easily makes it up to the first branch. She reaches a hand down to help your sister up into the branches, and whispers something to her before doing the same for you. Your sister has already climbed higher, and you watch as she reaches for one of the glass jars, one that faintly glows pink in the daylight. You hear the scream before you see her reaching into the jar, and it is the most heartbreaking sound when her fist snaps shut tight inside. The light fades almost instantly. It would be funny, the way her hand is now trapped in the jar, if your own heart wouldn't constrict in your chest so. A warm hand cups your cheek, and your vision swims as the story weaver turns your gaze to look into her haunting eyes. That light blue one behind you, I do believe you've met before. When she lets go, she leans back against the branches, in a nook which looks more comfortable than it has any right to. Let us continue the tale out here. She smiles. Fresh air is good for the soul. <laughs>